for the love of a broken lord. Written by Edith Bird and published by Starfall Publications. Available on our website and on Amazon. Save more with our bundles. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Back straight, shoulders down, eyes straight ahead. It was the rule of three that was drilled into Emma's mind like a poem. One she recited to herself at any spare moment she could afford. The carriage ride felt like the perfect opportunity to practice her mantra, since she was already trying to tune out the sound of her mother and sisters as it was. She was unsure if her father was listening to what was being said. If he was, the Duke was very good at focusing on the passing countryside, while also listening intently. I'm just saying, it's only going to have poor implications for us. Elaine's pitch was too high to ignore anymore. Emma let her shoulders sag as she stared at her younger sister. Elaine wore her blonde curls loosely while they made the journey through the country to their cousin's estate. Emma wished she was afforded such a luxury, but instead her hair was pinned so tight that her face felt slightly stretched from it. Your sister is trying her best, their mother spoke up. This is going to be the year. It has to be. I'm right here, Emma said finally. And yet, you speak of me as though I'm riding one of the carriage horses and out of earshot. Perhaps there will be someone for you at Louise's party, Elaine chimed in once again. I'm going to wish my cousin a happy 18th birthday and warn her of what pressure will be put on her by even those closest to her, Emma said, firing a glare at her sister. Searching for men isn't something I like to busy myself with at an event like this. If we're being honest, Susan the middle child said, you never look for a man who could be a suitable husband. Emma stared at her sister with a look that said, not you too. Susan was only two years Emma's junior, and normally the one who would jump to her defence. But it seemed that on the matter of marriage, it was very clearly every young woman for herself. We just don't want you to become destitute. Her mother's tone was much softer than her sister's. Or worse, a spinster for a sister, Elaine added with a theatrical gasp. If her parents hadn't been in the carriage with them, Emma would have rolled her eyes at her sister's comments. The Partingtons had a reputation to uphold. They had a place in society that Emma knew she was putting in danger with her choices. She was going to let the family down if she didn't find a husband. And soon. Elaine, her mother scolded at such brash talk in the carriage. But it's true, mother, Elaine persisted. Emma is the one who will marry and her husband will inherit the duchy, correct? She needs to choose before there is nobody left who is prepared to marry an older woman. Emma felt the heat rising in her cheeks, but she bit her tongue and remained composed. Inside, though, she was plotting how she would get revenge on her younger sister for the things she was saying. Emma wasn't normally malicious, and so all she could think was to, perhaps, leave one of her sister's skirts out in the sun for too long to discolour the material. She knew if it were the other way around, the mischievous girl would plan something much worse for her. But Emma was the eldest, and she had a responsibility to her family, so she couldn't stoop to such levels. Are we nearly there yet? It's getting awfully hot in here, Emma said while beginning to fan her face with the lace-trimmed fan that matched the same blue hue of her dress. She's trying to dodge the question, Elaine mumbled. That's enough from you, her mother said before turning to Emma. I'm sure it cannot be much longer. You know as well as I, it's a relatively straight road from Padvine to Louise's estate. Imagine if we had to travel all the way down to London. Now that would be much more of a commitment. Padvine was the vast house the Duke and his family called home. It was the large estate where Emma had grown up, and it held many fond memories in every nook and corner. Travelling anywhere felt wrong to her, for Emma felt safe on the grounds of Padvine and didn't like leaving. Even when going to London, the buzzing city of opportunity, Emma wanted nothing more than to be back on the lawn reading a book in the afternoon sun. London was too crowded and there were far too many staring eyes and mouths talking about her. Emma shuddered at even the thought. Luckily, 
There were no trips planned to the capital in the near future, but she was concerned about finding a husband in time to please her family. While Emma didn't want to end up as a spinster, as her sister had suggested, she knew what she wanted in a man, someone who would respect and love her, someone who would not see the imbalance of their arrangement and try to take advantage of it. She winced internally, wondering if it was too much to ask for. It was a beautiful day. While travelling such a distance in the rain came with its own risks, Emma couldn't stand being cooped up in a carriage when she could be out with the sun on her skin. I hope the party is out in their gardens. I remember Louise being excited to show me the grounds the last time we were there. Emma said while staring out of the carriage window. I hope her parents are sensible and keep the party indoors, her mother said, shaking her head. But look how nice a day it is, Emma said, pointing out of the window. It would be a pity to spend the early evening inside. Think of the insects, her mother said, cringing. Emma, again, found herself digging deep to refrain from rolling her eyes. Will you just promise tonight you will at least lower your expectations? Elaine said. Emma didn't know how to respond. She wasn't willing to compromise just to marry someone who would make her life no harder. She was the daughter of a duke, and that meant all manner of men came calling to try to win her hand. It attracted the kind of men Emma wouldn't even dream of holding a conversation with, let alone entertaining the prospect of marriage. She wanted a gentleman, not one who was simply trying to elevate his status in society. I can't make any promises, Emma said finally, realising all eyes aside from her father's were on her. But I will try to keep an open mind this evening. Her words were clearly the correct ones, for they were met with muted surprise. Back straight, shoulders down, eyes straight ahead. Emma knew she had a duty to her family, and while finding a husband from the crop of usual suspects wasn't so appealing to her, Emma no longer had age on her side to bide her time. They drew closer to her cousin's estate, and for the first time, it began to dawn on her that her time was running out. Chapter 2 The pins in her hair matched the pale blue of Emma's beautiful dress and put the finishing touches on her outfit. Her heart was beating a little faster now they were all settled in the guest rooms. The party was less than an hour away. I don't know why I feel like this, Emma said to Susan. I should be excited for Louise's birthday. Instead, I'm worried everyone will be looking at me. I hope everyone is looking at you in that dress, Susan shrugged off the comment. She had her hair tied back away from her neck and shoulders. There was also a determination in her eyes that Emma knew meant she was going to be looking out for suitable husbands. For both of them. The dress was beautiful, but... Emma felt almost terrified to go downstairs in it. She would be garnering the kind of attention which usually caused her skin to prickle. Of course, she had appeared in society many times in the past, though each time she had maintained an air of plainness about her. But that night felt different. Something had shifted in the atmosphere, though she couldn't pinpoint what it was. Louise already told me that the Earl of Gloucester's son will be here, Susan said, putting the finishing touches on Emma's hair. Oh, really? Elaine added. Well, the Duke of Cumbria is also rumoured to be bringing along his son. Emma knew what her sisters were doing. They were throwing around names and titles in a subtle way to prepare her for what was to come. She had always been bad with names. That was never more evident than when she was standing in a ballroom faced with men who would be offended if she were to address them incorrectly. What about the Earl of Shaftesbury? I hear he is perhaps the most handsome of all the eligible bachelors, Elaine said, pretending to swoon as she finished her question. I'm not sure he'll be here. It's quite a way for him to come, and I hear he is not the least bit interested in parties. That sounds perfect for Emma. Emma shot her younger sister a pointed look in response. I have never said I didn't like the parties and events, Emma found herself on the defensive. I just prefer them when I'm not being stared at by a large group of eligible men. You and I clearly have very different preferences, Elaine chuckled. She was only 18, and yet sometimes 
Elaine made comments that were far beyond her years. Come on, Emma, just think of the fun you'll have tonight, and the added bonus of dancing with different gentlemen. Susan was trying to reason with her. You look incredible. I doubt that anyone will be able to keep their eyes off you. If that is an attempt to cheer me up, I fear you don't know me at all. Emma couldn't help but chuckle. She knew she was going to have to stand up and do her duty for her family sometime. She just hadn't anticipated that the time would be that evening. She had spent so long getting out of such events. But a family birthday had sneaked up on her and provided the best chance for her family to spring such a dilemma onto her. I will keep an eye out and dance with all the men who ask. I promise, Emma said, letting out a deep and heavy sigh. Her nerves were building like a bank of grey clouds. Her legs suddenly felt as though they could betray her at any moment. She grimaced at the thought of stealing all the attention of the night onto herself. But that was exactly what her family wanted for her. She had to marry, and there was no more time to be wasted. Oh, don't you just look beautiful? Her mother gushed as the three of them finally emerged from their room. Emma already wanted the entire affair to be over with. All three of you will shine tonight. Emma passed her mother and took a step out into the upstairs hallway of the Grand Estate. They were staying in the guest wing, and the decorations were slightly different to those in the main part of the house. The strip of carpet was a copper colour, which complemented the wooden floor around its edges. The walls were a pale beige that allowed the oil paintings in golden frames to grab the attention of anyone passing by. It reminded Emma of being back in Padvine, but the many rooms and corridors here could easily make the place feel like a labyrinth instead of a home. I love it when the girls do your hair like this, her mother gushed as she walked to her side. Her mother gently touched the few stray blonde hairs that hung to frame her face a little. Though Emma had once read, in a forbidden book that her mother had since disposed of, that some men liked girls with a more common look about them. The book had caused a scandal amongst society members, and Emma was warned to never speak of its title again. Her mother had made a comment about how she hoped it was the only scandal her eldest daughter would ever be involved with. Your father is already downstairs, and talking with some other guests, her mother continued. I think he has a lot of expectation for you too. Emma winced at the thought of her father wanting her to rush and find a husband. She knew he was concerned about whom she would pick. He wasn't going to hand over the duchy to just anyone, and he wasn't going to agree to a marriage if there was something wrong with him. But at the same time, it appeared that he too was tired of waiting for her to make a decision. You don't think he will find a husband for me, do you? Emma asked in a hushed tone as her sisters trailed behind them. They started to descend the carpeted stairs, a sparkling chandelier fitting snugly into the space created by the staircase. I honestly don't know, dear. I know that he has spoken of it in the past, but we agreed it would be fairer to leave it up to you. Emma swallowed thickly, her gloved hand holding onto the banister as the sound of chatter and a string quartet floated up to meet them. They reached the ground floor and there was now only a large wooden door separating the four women from the ballroom. Emma's stomach churned, the heavy feeling of pressure on her shoulders almost causing her to slouch as they slowly approached it. Shoulders down, back straight. No, that's the wrong order. She panicked, trying to recite the mantra in her mind. Her mother's steps were relentless, and the servant in the doorway was already reaching for the gleaming handle. Emma felt her heart thumping so loudly that it was creating its own beat in her ears. I can't do this, she whispered, her feet stopping before she could calculate the consequences. Yes, you can, dear, her mother said quickly. Come on, Emma. Elaine spoke a little louder than Emma had been hoping for. There's nothing to worry about. It's only a party. Her breathing was rapid and the sweaty skin of her palms clung to the white gloves as they pulsed with nerves. I can't. Emma shook her head once more. I really can't. I'm sorry, mother. She turned to see the disappointment in her mother's eyes. 
Emma's own blue eyes were wide and filled with fear and nerves. Emma, her mother said while giving her arm a gentle tug. Emma had no choice but to follow her mother, away from the servant who hesitated in confusion at what to do. You need to calm down and focus on what needs to be done. Think of how many women would love to be in your position, about to enter a ball knowing they and their title are perhaps the most desirable in the room. Nobody is going to want a girl on the cusp of spinsterhood. Emma cringed at the thought. Then think of your sisters, her mother tried again, her features softening somewhat. Think of the way your marriage will set the tone for their own. If you fail to secure a match, you will be doing more than just yourself a disservice. It was the guilt that Emma needed. It forced her to turn back to the door where her sisters were waiting for her. Just because she couldn't find the right man didn't mean that she had to subject her sisters to the same fate. All right, Emma said, beginning to nod her head. I will do it for them. Chapter 3 I don't understand why you insist on us going to another one of these events when you know I will only be met by the same disappointment, Jonathan groaned. His brother was rushing him, and if there was one thing Jonathan couldn't stand, it was being rushed. We have to at least show our faces. If you have so much of a problem with it, why did you let me accept the invitation weeks ago? We have to show up or risk being shunned from future events, his brother Thomas said in a cool tone. I don't think we have to worry about being shunned, Jonathan said, shrugging his shoulders. Oh, yes, I forgot. Thomas chuckled sarcastically. Because you are the Earl of Shaftesbury and because you are eligible, you like to think yourself invincible. If you keep rolling your eyes like that, you could cause them to fall out. Jonathan rolled his eyes again. I only meant that people like to invite us, he said to his younger brother. Perhaps we could just pretend that there was some sort of family emergency that we both had to tend to. Jonathan, hurry up with your tie. We're leaving in a few minutes. Jonathan could only grimace at his brother as he continued to fight with the tie around his neck. You never know. There could be some beautiful women there this evening. Perhaps someone will take your fancy. The women are always the same, Jonathan said, pulling a sour face. None of them are interesting enough. They are just interested in being a countess. Jonathan checked his appearance in the mirror one final time, his brother standing in the doorway. Thomas was still trying to hurry him along, but Jonathan wasn't going to let it get to him. With one hand, he pushed back his brown curls, making sure that they were all in place and looked presentable. His green eyes were complemented by the dark suit he wore, though he felt far too uncomfortable in his new shoes. Come on, my lady, you look beautiful, Thomas mocked from the doorway. Jonathan rolled his eyes once more, though he made sure to face his younger brother so that Thomas saw the gesture. The carriage ride was only made worse by Thomas's insistent comments on Jonathan's status as a bachelor. Jonathan hated the sensation of the carriage rocking and winced every time the wheels dipped and clattered from a hole in the road. You know that you cannot be a bachelor forever, Thomas continued. No, because I'm not the simpleton you think me to be. I'm merely trying to give you some good advice, brother, Thomas said. Jonathan couldn't think of the last time his brother had said something that was actually of some use, though he bit his tongue and didn't express such a thought. Jonathan knew that it would do no good to actually start that kind of quarrel while neither of them could leave the carriage. I feel it's rather easy for you to say from your position as a married man, Jonathan said instead. I'm just trying to show you that marriage is not as difficult as you're making it out to be. Jonathan had heard enough of his brother droning on about finding a woman. He had more ambition than that, and his brother was trying to get him to see past this. But I don't think I'm quite finished travelling yet, Jonathan said, knowing it would only vex his brother further. I want to see more of the world without having to drag around a wife in doing so. I want the freedom I have now. I already hate having to explain myself to you, let alone if I had to explain myself to my wife. Thomas let out a sigh of frustration. You're impossible. I don't know how else I can say it. You can't remain a bachelor forever. 
you are almost 28. Do you really think you're going to be able to keep this up? I will show you what I mean when we arrive at the party, Jonathan responded in a much calmer tone than his brother. The women in this layer of society are plain and boring. They see my title before me and I cannot muster the energy to feign interest in any of them. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Stepping into the ball and being the centre of attention was something Jonathan had often taken in his stride. When there was nobody who took his interest, Jonathan simply kept his head up and stared past the sea of people. He was free to converse with whomever he wanted, all the while dodging pushy mothers and title-hungry ladies. The ball that evening was no exception. Jonathan stepped into the room with the party already underway. He felt eyes on him before he had even taken in the entirety of the room. His shoulders were stretched back and his chest slightly puffed out, though his lips remained in a tight line and his jaw was set. Jonathan wanted to appear as uninviting as possible, but he knew that his attempts would thwart only a few. Whisperings of Jonathan and Shaftesbury could be heard from around him, and Jonathan even caught his brother rolling his eyes. You may wish to be careful, Thomas, Jonathan said with a slight chuckle, you roll your eyes like that too much and you could cause them to fall out. He could feel his brother bristling at the way Jonathan was using his own sarcasm against him. However, with so many eyes on them, Thomas could do nothing but force a smile onto his face and chuckle in response. See, I told you how appreciated your presence would be this evening, Thomas muttered as they walked through the crowded room to the table of refreshments. Jonathan was already sick of the keen mothers, already trying to catch his attention, to see if he would make a match with their daughters. And I distinctly remember telling you that I didn't want my presence to be such a highlight of the evening. Jonathan spoke quickly in response. But he knew as one of the few eligible earls, he was bound to have a lot of attention on him. Oh, come on, just try to enjoy yourself, Thomas said, laughing off the tension that seemed to be brewing between them. Perhaps I should just pick a name out of a hat, Jonathan mumbled as the pair were handed drinks by one of the servants. He took a large gulp of the champagne, not caring if it wasn't what people wanted to see from someone like him. I'm not sure that could work in your favour, Thomas chuckled. You need a match that is of advantage, not just because you have to get married. Then you pick for me, Jonathan shrugged. Someone quiet who does not care if I disappear to the other side of the world for a few weeks. I fear you would come to loathe me if you had me pick your wife. Thomas laughed a lot louder now. Why don't you be on your best behaviour tonight, and it may not be as hard a task as you think it is. Jonathan couldn't help but scoff at his brother's words. The storm of women before him did not present the task as easy. It was perhaps anything but that. Ah, uh, Lord Campbell, a pitched voice cut the brothers off from their conversation. Jonathan turned to see a woman with pinched lips, high eyebrows and beady eyes seeking out his attention. Jonathan, this is Lady Harriet Gordon and her daughter Mary, Thomas said, clearing his throat. Lady Gordon. Jonathan nodded politely before turning to her daughter. Lady Mary. It was only courtesy to kiss her hand, but Jonathan could tell people were beginning to look their way. It wasn't as though there was anything inherently wrong with Mary Gordon. She just appeared rather plain to Jonathan. It was perhaps the eagerness of her mother that also deterred him from pursuing anything further. Her mother was clearly calculating what his title would do for their family, and that was something that instantly left a sour taste in his mouth. Would you excuse me a moment? Jonathan bowed his head before stepping away from the two women and taking his brother with him. I wish there was a way I could scold you for what just happened, but I do not blame you for getting away from that one, Thomas mused, and Jonathan found himself laughing with him. It wasn't exactly kind, but he had needed to get away from Lady Gordon, for it would be unkind to entertain something he had no interest in pursuing. All right, I'll make sure they aren't all as bad as the Gordons, Thomas added, 
I am going to get another drink. I am not sure how much more of this I can handle. Jonathan murmured into his brother's ear. You drink like a bachelor. Thomas shook his head, but Jonathan simply raised his empty glass to his brother as though to toast his comment. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Emma stared about the room, her heart still hammering in her chest and a sheen of sweat moistening her back. The room was incredibly busy, something she found a blessing because it was hard for all the attention to ever be on her. After wishing her cousin a happy birthday, Emma was left with only one other purpose of the function, to find a husband who would satisfy her family. She was still wrestling with the fact that the likelihood of her finding a husband who truly loved her was slim. The thought stung and caused the pleasant smile to slide from her expression. Mother, I've been asked to dance. Elaine's voice was pitched with excitement as she rushed over to where Emma was standing with her mother and Susan at the edge of the dance floor. How exciting, her mother smiled. Emma knew that her mother's focus wouldn't be fully on her sisters until Emma had succeeded in her job first. Now that they were both getting to the age of needing to find a husband too, Emma knew that she was only becoming more of a burden. I heard that the Earl of Shaftesbury is here somewhere, Susan mumbled from her side. Her sister's eyes weren't looking at her as she spoke. Instead, Susan was searching the crowd of faces for a man neither of them had ever seen before. Is that good? You really don't keep up with the news, do you? Susan chuckled. Just because I'm not jumping to grab the next gossip paper doesn't mean that I don't keep up, Emma said, trying to defend herself. He is the one you were speaking about while we were getting ready. Exactly, Susan nodded in a hurry. He is apparently very handsome, but he is also very eligible and that is a very good thing for us. What if he is awful? Emma asked, turning to look at her sister once more. You always think the worst of people, don't you? Emma merely shrugged. I don't even know what he looks like. Perhaps he isn't handsome, and it was just gossip that has elevated his status. He is an earl, after all, and maybe people are just trying to convince themselves that he is handsome when it is, in fact, his title they find handsome. Emma knew that this wasn't what her sister wanted to hear, but she didn't care. Don't you understand that you can't afford to be so picky now you're getting older? Susan had turned to look at her fully. Her gaze was sharp and unrelenting. That's rather rude. You are only two years my junior, Emma fired back. And yet I am prepared to find a husband already. Without saying another word, Emma turned on her heels and decided to walk about the party in the hopes of finding someone who would appease her family. She was slightly deflated at the thought of no longer focusing on just appeasing her own expectations. Her mind was adrift with thoughts of how she would ever find a man to marry, and she wasn't even looking where she was going. Her eyes were fixated on the wooden floor, her brow knitted tightly. A sudden thump to her shoulder dragged her attention back to the party, her drink sloshing over the side of the glass and straight onto the man before her. Chapter 4 It all happened so fast that for a moment, Emma wasn't sure which way was up. A gasp escaped her lips, her feet were suddenly sliding against the wood, and her balance failed her completely. The next thing she knew, there were arms around her back and eyes staring into her face. Her breathing was erratic and a few strands of hair had been tossed over her face in the scuffle. They remained in that position for some time. The man with his arms holding her, Emma bent backward and relying completely on his strength to stop her from hitting the ground. Green eyes filled with concern and confusion stared down at her. Are you all right? The man asked as he helped her to her feet. Emma felt heat burning in her cheeks. The embarrassment of what had just happened only just beginning to hit her. A few people were staring at her. Thankfully, the rest of the room was continuing with the party, the music loud enough to have muffled the sound which had escaped her lips when she fell. I'm fine, thank you, Emma said after finally straightening up and trying to brush the stray strands of hair from her vision. I apologise. I did not mean to... 
I, I, I'm sorry. She tripped over her words just as she had tripped over the rather handsome man in front of her. Emma swallowed thickly and tried her best to appear composed, but doubt seeped into her mind, followed quickly by embarrassment. It's fine, really, the man said, trying to brush the liquid off the sleeve of his dark jacket. No harm done. But Emma was beyond embarrassed. She took a few steps back before spotting a nearby exit. The man appeared to follow her gaze and took a step closer to stop her. Please, I do not even know your name. Emma was already stepping around him as fast as she could without it appearing to the people around her as though she was rushing towards the exit. She needed fresh air and wanted nothing more than to be on her own after what had just happened. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Are you all right, brother? Perfectly fine, Jonathan said, keeping his gaze on the door the young woman had just rushed through. It had all happened so quickly that he wasn't sure whose fault it had been. Jonathan had been staring out at the dance floor, trying to get a look at who his competition was in terms of the men wooing all the eligible women of the season. His gaze hadn't exactly been on where he was walking, and so he didn't feel able to blame it on the girl. Your jacket is ruined, Thomas pointed out while trying to dab at the wet sleeve with his gloved hand. It's fine, it will dry. And then you will be a true bachelor, smelling of alcohol. Come, shall we see if our hosts have a spare jacket for you? Thomas asked while gesturing for them to go the other way. But Jonathan shook his head quickly. It's not that serious, Thomas. It will dry and it will be fine. Jonathan couldn't seem to tear his eyes away from the exit, but in his mind, he was remembering the image of her face beneath him. Before we continue into the story, do us a favour. Like this video and hit the subscribe button because it helps very much with YouTube's algorithm. If you want the audiobooks ads free, visit our website and select our bundles to save more. Thank you again. Now back to our story. Her wide blue eyes had been so entrancing and the late afternoon sunlight caught strands of her golden hair in a way that made it sparkle. Are you all right there? You appear rather stunned, Thomas asked, laughing at his brother's condition. Perhaps I am stunned, Jonathan murmured. He felt as though he was snapping out of a strange daze. What was her name? Who? Thomas asked. His eyes narrowed in confusion. The girl that just clattered into you? Why do you want her name? I just... Jonathan glanced back at the doorway. With one hand, he scratched the back of his head, still trying to work out what had happened. I see she must have caught your eye, Thomas said. The fact that his brother was now catching on caused Jonathan's senses to sharpen. Thomas chuckled at the look on his face, which caused Jonathan to quickly shake his head and turn his attention to the dance floor. I was just a little flustered by what happened, Jonathan said. But as you said, we should get back to the ball. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. What happened in there? Emma was almost hunched over outside as she tried to regain her breath and wished that Susan hadn't found her so easily. Nothing. I was just taking a break, Emma said, shaking her head quickly. Don't you think it is hot in there? Emma, I saw you causing a commotion. What happened? Susan asked in a much softer voice. I don't want to talk about it, Emma said, shaking her head. Luckily, only a few droplets of her drink had landed on her dress but the clear liquid quickly dried and wasn't noticeable. Emma grimaced as she thought about the man's wet jacket and how she couldn't even imagine stepping back into the party after what she had done. Come then, let's go back inside, Susan said, gently touching her arm. I'm going to stay out here for a while, Emma said. Susan laughed. You aren't going to find a husband out here though, are you? Perhaps there is a young and handsome gardener who will steal my affections, and I will fall hopelessly in love with him. Emma murmured, glancing out at the empty grounds. The hedgerows and gravel paths were empty of people, everyone's attention firmly on the party inside. Emma, Susan sighed, whatever happened can't have been that bad. You didn't see? Emma shook her head without elaborating. 
Well, we're going to need to go in at some point. We can't stay out here all evening, and I'm sure it will only get colder. But Emma didn't care about the cold. All she cared about was leaving the party and retiring to bed before anyone could stop her. But her sister wasn't going to relent until she agreed to go back into the ballroom. The man I bumped into, he was asking for my name before I rushed out here. Emma shuddered at the thought. Do you think I could get in trouble? For bumping into someone, I highly doubt it, Susan said. Come on, it's a crowded room. It's unlikely that you will see him again. Emma had never walked with such reluctance before, but her sister gently guided her back towards the door. Her nerves were in tatters, but she knew that there was too much expectation on her shoulders for her to turn back now. Chapter 5 Back in the hot ballroom, the dancing and chattering continued. Emma realised that she was going to have to make her presence a little better known if she was going to catch the eye of the remaining eligible gentlemen. Many of them were already engaging in their first dance with keener younger girls. Emma suddenly felt a rush of determination. She had to find a husband in that room, and that was what she was going to do. How about him? Emma asked her sister, nodding in the direction of a man with dirty blonde hair that looked to be on the cusp of needing a tidy up. No, Susan shook her head. He is Mr Crookshank, a lawyer. I've heard some bad things about his family and what they do. Scandals? Many, Susan said quickly before averting her eyes to find someone else. And him. Lord Ravensbourne? Susan said. Emma turned to see her sister scrunching up her nose. I think you can do better. I'm not doing anything at the moment and I still haven't danced with anyone. Don't worry, we'll find someone. That is all I've heard from you all this evening and yet I'm still no closer to finding a husband. Emma could hold her opinion in no longer. Emma, there will be someone here. Let's just be patient. But Emma no longer found comfort in her sister's words. With a huff of frustration, she turned her attention to the dance floor. Couples were moving as one, the newly introduced trying their best to steal a conversation when the dance allowed it. Part of her wish she had more luck with finding someone, that she could live like all the other women in society and put herself out there more. But he couldn't be just any man. He had to be one that impressed her father, kind and understanding to her, and likeable enough that her mother and sisters had no objections. Her attention was suddenly caught by the feeling of eyes on her, the hairs on the back of her neck prickled, and her body tensed. Emma kept still, but let her eyes dart around until she caught someone's gaze. Instantly, her heart dropped, and she wasn't sure how to react as he stared at her from the other side of the dance floor. His green eyes were piercing, even from a distance, and it was clear that he wasn't going to relent. Emma flushed, succumbing to his gaze, and turned away. She felt uncomfortable by the way he was staring so blatantly. What about him? Susan asked. Her eyes had clearly followed her sister's. He looks like he might be interested. Emma shifted her weight from one foot to the other. Do you think so? Well, he is rather handsome, and judging by the eyes on him, he must be one of the eligible earls. Emma let her gaze fall back to him. He was no longer looking at her, but she couldn't help admire his sharp jaw and dark curls. As though he could sense something, his eyes found hers once more. You should talk to him, Susan said. Emma stared, but she remained where she was. What's wrong? He's the one that I bumped into, Emma said, though she hadn't expected her voice to sound quite so wooden. Ah, Susan muttered. Are you sure? I don't think I would make a mistake with that, Emma said as she recalled staring up into his green eyes. For a moment, the world around her had ceased to matter because all she could focus on was the face above her. Nobody had ever stirred such a feeling in her like that. Well, it would do no harm to try. Perhaps I could get Mother to introduce the two of you. Susan was still trying to get her to go over, but Emma had decided she wasn't moving. 
Susan walked away from her, as if leaving her on her own would encourage her to go over and talk to the man she had already embarrassed herself in front of. Emma had thought the evening couldn't get any worse, but she had clearly been wrong. Her heart hammered as she turned back to see if the man was still staring at her, but he was suddenly no longer there. Emma blinked a few times, the twirling people on the dance floor obscuring her view, but she was certain he was no longer where he had been standing. It's all rather dull, isn't it? Emma let out a pinched gasp at the sound of a much deeper voice next to her. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you, he continued as she turned to take him in from up close. Emma could still hear her heart pounding in her ears, but now he was in front of her. She couldn't escape so easily. To do so twice would be very rude indeed. It's fine, Emma said, straightening up. I'm sorry for my rudeness earlier. You mean when you decided to soak my jacket in champagne? He asked, cocking an eyebrow. She could tell that there had been no real harm done from the way his lip curled up into a smirk of triumph. What makes you think it was my fault? Emma asked, unsure where she was finding such courage from all of a sudden. Pardon me, but I was the one standing still, he answered, laughing. Emma felt the heat returning to her cheeks, as though her face was harbouring a wildfire below its surface. I only jest with you, he spoke up once more when Emma continued to stare down at her shoes. I do not mean to offend you. I was just having some fun. I am sorry, though. I fear I may have ruined your jacket. Emma couldn't help but notice people around them stealing glances in their direction. It confused her at first, for she didn't understand what they were looking at. Emma feared that rumours were spreading about her bumping into the man, and she didn't like the idea of people talking about her, especially if it was for a negative reason. It will dry, he shrugged. It is only a jacket, though you could repay me in the form of telling me your name. Emma should have known such a question was coming, and that he wouldn't relent now he had asked for her name twice. Lady Emma Partington, she said, extending her hand. He graciously accepted and kissed the back of it gently. Emma felt a rush of excitement run through her body at the feel of his gloved hand taking hers. It is a pleasure to meet you, Lady Emma, he smiled down at her. And you are... Ah, uh, yes, my name is Jonathan Campbell. I'm the Earl of Shaft's Esbury he explained, smiling in a slightly more bashful manner than he had done before. Style, iris, e, text, align, left. My lord, Emma said, bowing her head slightly. She remembered the conversation she had been having with her sisters when they were getting ready for the party earlier. Her sisters had mentioned the man who seemed so intrigued by her and the stares of people around them started to make sense. He wasn't just an eligible bachelor, he was the eligible bachelor of the season. Would you care to dance? The song is not yet over, Emma said, turning her head for a moment to the dance floor. You wouldn't want to join halfway through, he teased. Having all eyes of the party being on me doesn't appeal to me that much, she admitted, shrugging her shoulders. She wasn't sure why the Earl was making her feel much more comfortable, but his gaze was causing her to warm to him. That is surprising. Jonathan said, narrowing his eyes. Partington, your father is a duke, is he not? Do I have your attention now? She teased, knowing that men could easily be impressed by such a title. You had my attention long before that, Lady Partington. His voice was much more intense than it had been before. It didn't waver or hesitate. She found herself getting lost in his gaze. Her heartbeat had slowed, and it felt as though the world around her had followed suit. Emma wished she could say something in response, but her tongue felt tied. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The nervous girl, who had bumped into him, stared up at him in a way that had Jonathan fighting against his own urges. She had a presence about her that drew him in. It was partly what had drawn him to circle around the room and talk to her. I hope you don't mind me saying, Lady Partington, and forgive my staring, but you are perhaps the most beautiful woman in the room. 
Part of him wished he hadn't said it. He was normally never so forward with his words, but Jonathan wasn't feeling like himself. She made him dizzy. He watched her face brighten to a smile before flushing with modesty. Are you always quite so forward, Lord Campbell? She asked, finally looking back up at him. Please, call me Jonathan, he said. Then you should call me Emma. Something inside him stirred. He suddenly wanted to know everything about her, and that had never been his first thought when talking with women before. For the first time in a very long time, Jonathan felt out of his depth. The music was coming to an end, and Jonathan remembered her words about not wanting to join a dance that was already in progress. The sound of the music ending, though, meant that he had another opportunity, and it was one he wasn't going to waste. Well then, Emma, he said, testing out the name as though it were a new food he was tasting on his tongue. Will you have this next dance? She was looking at his outstretched hand as he asked, her brow slightly furrowed. Chapter 6 Emma didn't need to look around to know that people were still watching their interaction. By complete accident, she had found herself talking with the most eligible man in the room, and that explained why some of the mothers were glaring at her. After all, she had already had her years of opportunity, but hadn't taken them. They would be thinking she should leave a man like the Earl of Shaftesbury for the younger girls in their debut season but he was talking to her and now he wanted to dance with her. Emma couldn't believe this was happening. His outstretched hand was an invitation for the entire room to see his intentions, and she couldn't refuse such a thing. It would have been more than just rude. It would have ruined her chances as well as her family's reputation. Aside from that, Emma took his hand because she wanted to. Slowly, they made their way onto the dance floor, as the string quartet picked up the music with a new song, one that everyone knew the dance for. Emma remembered the lesson she'd been subjected to while growing up. It had never been something she enjoyed, but her mother had insisted they would one day be important. She hadn't realised until that exact moment, as she weaved around Jonathan, how right she had been. You have an air about you that I just can't place, Jonathan said in a low voice. There were plenty of other couples talking as they danced around them, but nobody wanted to be heard by anyone other than their partner. Are you trying to call me clumsy? Emma asked, raising an eyebrow, because I do not usually bump into earls. I see, but you usually bump into others? Emma realised the error of her words and how he was undermining how she had phrased it. She couldn't help but laugh and shake her head. You are the first I have bumped into in such a way at a ball. Then I am honoured, Jonathan smiled. I wish that every man could know the honour of being bumped into by as beautiful a lady as yourself. Are you always so charming? Emma was still laughing, unable to stop herself from blushing. Her face felt it hadn't had a reprieve from blushing all evening. Only when I want to charm... He shrugged his shoulders before using both arms to twirl her around. With her back turned to him momentarily, she caught sight of her sister in the crowd of people watching the dancers. Susan was beaming as though she were her mother rather than her younger sister. Shaftesbury, you say? Emma asked when the movements allowed her to face him once more. I have never been so far south. Then... You haven't been afforded the privilege of experiencing some of the greatest areas of countryside. We have a residence in Norfolk where there is plenty of countryside to make up for it, Emma said. There is also the coast. A few miles away, I share the same luxury, Jonathan said. Emma could tell that he was trying to draw similarities between them. She had experienced men do that in the past, though it had never interested her before. This was different entirely because she wanted to find more things she had in common with the Earl. Do you ride? She asked, running through a list in her mind of things she could do with the Earl if she were to see him again. Then Emma caught herself, surprised at how after so little interaction, she was already thinking about what they would do together next. I do. I enjoy riding through the woods around my estate, 
There are so many acres to explore, he said. Me too, Emma nodded. Padvine, my father's estate, is filled with areas of woodland that I am yet to explore. Ever since I was a girl, I have owned a pony named Charlotte, and for a while, she was my best friend. They both laughed at this. The idea of a child finding comfort in a pony could be interpreted as either amusing or concerning. Were there no other girls around? None that wanted to talk about anything other than marriage, Emma said. Jonathan was staring at her intently as they continued to dance. She suddenly became rather aware of how blatant she had been about her views. Emma knew that she shouldn't be so open about her ambitions outside of marriage with someone she had just met. Tell me you find these events as unnecessary as I do, Jonathan sighed as the dance came to an end. I am against the very nature of these balls. Emma nodded slowly as he took her hand and led her off the dance floor. I find them exhausting and would much rather not be in attendance for the reasons that I am. The sea of people parted for them as they made their way into an area where they weren't so easily viewable by the entire room. Do you want to get away from it? What do you mean? Emma asked with a frown and stopped suddenly in hesitation. Meet me on the balcony. Wait another two dances. Jonathan's voice was like silk as he spoke, and Emma felt her heart skip a beat. If it's not too much to ask, I would enjoy a second dance. With that, he walked towards a man who was watching him with suspicion. For a moment, Emma forgot how to breathe. She took a deep breath before nodding slowly, even though he had already moved on. She kept her eyes on him until he disappeared into the crowd, his dark curls the last thing she saw before he rounded a corner. In her mind, Emma mulled over his request. The idea of meeting on the balcony caused her heart to race. Where on earth did that come from? Emma found herself jolting as her sister rushed over to her. Style is text align left. What are you talking about? Emma asked, trying to act nonchalant. What just happened? One moment he was staring at you and the next you're dancing in his arms. The entire room will be talking about you before long. Emma shrugged as she tried not to let the information get to her. He asked me to dance, and I was in no position to refuse him, she said. He is the Earl of Shaftesbury. You like him, don't you? Susan asked, cocking an eyebrow. He is the one you've been waiting for. Emma didn't want to get ahead of herself. It had been one dance, one dance that was already leading to another on the balcony later, and who knew what it would lead to beyond that. I hadn't expected him to be so charming, Emma said, a small smile growing on her face. Well, if you didn't have the pick of the room before, I'm sure you will now, Susan said, glancing around her. There is nothing a man loves more than a challenge, and I feel you have just become something to be won. Emma was confused by her sister's words until she turned to see just how many men were trying to catch her eye. She had been seen with Jonathan, and that had brought her to the forefront of the gathering's attention, something she hadn't intended to do at all. What do I do now? Emma whispered. I think you get to pick who you dance with next, Susan said, failing to contain her excitement. Emma didn't even have to glance over in her mother and Elaine's direction to know that they were both just as excited as Susan. This was what they had been trying to achieve all along. What if I've already chosen who has my affection? Emma frowned, thinking back to Jonathan. She hadn't anticipated that she would have to dance with anyone else. That was one dance, Emma, Susan responded. What if he changes his mind? It's always good to have other options. Emma bristled at her sister's shallowness. If he changes his mind, he will not have been the right man in the first place. All right, I'm only explaining the rules to you since you have never bothered to pay attention before, Susan said, holding her hands up in defence. He asked me to meet him on the balcony after two dances, Emma blurted out unable to keep the information to herself. It was what excited her more than anything. It was an extension of the time that she could spend with him. 
perhaps we could arrange a dance with Lord... What did you just say? Susan's pale blue eyes were suddenly wide as her head snapped in her sister's direction. I'm going to see him on the balcony, Emma said as though it were nothing, despite the way that her stomach was doing flips. Emma, is that... entirely... proper? Susan asked carefully. Emma couldn't help but laugh at the way her words had made her sister so uncomfortable. It usually wasn't that way around, and Emma took a moment to relish in that fact. You can act as chaperone if it would please you. I may keep watch, just to avoid any kind of scandal, Susan decided, nodding to herself slowly, as though forming a plan in her head. Emma knew that while she would be a little concerned, Susan would overthink the matter completely. Or you could stay with Mother and Elaine and keep them company. But Susan was already throwing her sister a look to say, don't even think about it. You have only just met this man, and I want to make sure that his intentions are strictly honourable. You sound worse than father, Emma said, but her sister flashed her a look of warning. The comment may have been slightly too far. You will thank me if what I warn you of comes to light, Susan fired back. I believe his intentions to be honourable, Emma said, folding her arms over her chest as she spoke. Yet it appeared that Susan was prepared to stand her ground. I hope you're right, but we do not know this man. His intentions could be something much worse. Chapter 7 I'm going to ask for her hand, Jonathan said breathlessly as he moved through the crowded room. What? His brother was hot on his heels, though Jonathan could sense the hesitation and panic in his voice. Jonathan... What are you talking about? You have known her for the duration of a single dance. How can you be so rash when you didn't even want to marry in the first place? Jonathan was listening to his brother, but he was also focusing or weaving in and out of the people around him to get out of the room. And yet, I know that she is someone that I could see being my wife, Jonathan said, looking over his shoulder to Thomas. She is the one who bumped into you. Thomas announced with a gasp. Did she bump your head? I'm perfectly sane, brother, Jonathan chuckled. She only spilled some champagne on my jacket. Style Sigo, text a line, left. Yes, I am aware. And in case you're not, those aren't grounds to ask for someone's hand. I cannot try to describe to you the kind of connection that I felt. I fear you will only mock me, Jonathan said. Is she at least well-connected? Will you benefit at all from this bizarre and sudden match? Jonathan stopped walking for a moment and turned to face his brother. Her father is a duke, was all he had to say for Thomas's face to light up. You know, you don't have to pretend to have this special connection as you did, his older brother remarked. You could have just led with the fact that her father is a duke. But I wasn't lying, and I don't expect you to understand either. Jonathan continued through the crowd after shaking his brother off. He didn't want to talk about it to Thomas anymore, especially since it was clear he wasn't going to accept his decision. Just think about this for a moment, John. Jonathan sighed in frustration as he was forced to turn around once more and scowl at his brother for being so loud. I was not even considering marriage before this evening so you have to trust me when I say that this is what I want to do. Jonathan made sure that his tone was firm. We danced and we talked, and it made me realise that we have similar interests. As I said, I'm not going to try to describe what I'm feeling to you. Where are you going now? Before speaking to you, I felt amazing, Jonathan said, peering at his brother. I wanted to explore more of the party since I have already arranged to see Lady Partington later this evening. I'm going to see what else the gentlemen are up to. They'll just be playing cards or something, Thomas grumbled. Jonathan continued on his route and didn't look back to see if his brother was following him. Jonathan stepped out of the bustling room and away from the centre of the party in search of new entertainment. He found exactly what he was looking for in the form of a room clouded with cigar smoke and the clinking of brandy glasses. 
It was much darker in the cards room than it had been in the well-lit ballroom with its many windows and chandeliers. Jonathan, though, liked the sudden change in atmosphere, nodding to the well-dressed gentleman he passed. People are making comments about us being in here? Thomas whispered in a harsh tone from his side. Jonathan hadn't noticed, but turned back to see gentlemen he had just nodded to now, talking while staring in his direction. Ah, Lord Campbell. Lord Durrell, Jonathan said, bowing his head politely. What a lovely evening it is. Certainly, the older gentleman said, looking down his nose at him. And what a strange room for a bachelor to find himself in. Though I suppose you have always had less of an interest in settling down. At least, that's what it looks like from my point of view. Jonathan refrained from bristling at the comments. He had been faced with such comments for years, ever since he had turned 24, and was still no closer to marriage than when he had first become a grown man. Well, you know me, I can't stay away from a good game of cards. Jonathan smiled and simply shrugged his shoulders. He wasn't going to rise to the bait, and he ignored his brother, who he could feel getting angrier by the minute. Indeed, Lord Durrell pursed his lips into a smile. Jonathan could tell that the gesture was incredibly forced, and there was a definite lack of sincerity behind it. Jonathan was in half a mind to make a comment about relishing, in the fact he and his brother were the only men in the room who were yet to find a grey hair, but he refrained. He knew that it would do his reputation no good to make such jibes, and so Jonathan just continued to smile and act pleasant. I still don't understand why we're here. Thomas said in a hushed tone. Despite the fact that he was already married, he still didn't thrive in the social circle of the men's card room. Jonathan, on the other hand, found that he did well at such games, both at the games involving cards and conversation. He was good at keeping his own emotions out of it and making sure that he didn't cut off opportunity too easily. That is why we're here, Jonathan said, nodding in the direction of the man with greying hair sitting only a few paces away from them. He had his back to them, and Jonathan could tell that his brother still didn't know who it was. The Duke. The Duke? Thomas's eyes narrowed for a moment before looking around in concern. Jonathan hadn't realised that his brother could become quite as self-conscious as he was at that moment. Yes, Lady Emma's father, the Duke of Norfolk. Jonathan said, feeling slightly puzzled that he was having to say such information to his brother again. You've come to speak with him about his daughter. No, Jonathan said, eyeing the table that the Duke was sitting at. I'm going to let him win at cards. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. A fine evening, don't you think, my lord? Jonathan asked, sitting down at the table opposite the older man. I'd say so, though I don't plan on showing my face out there, the Duke said, shaking off the comment. And you are. Lord Jonathan Campbell, the Earl of Shaftesbury, Jonathan said, bowing his head. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Earl of Shaftesbury, the Duke said, his eyes were narrowed in pensive thought. I feel I have heard you being talked about by my girls this evening. Perhaps... Jonathan was trying to be modest, but Thomas sat down at his side and quickly cut in. He is the most eligible man here this evening, Thomas gushed as though he himself was one of the ladies trying to win his favour. I see, and why do you find yourself in the card room then? Surely out there is where you want to be absorbing the attention, the Duke scoffed as he spoke. Jonathan was trying to work out what the Duke's tone meant, but it was no use. I have a good hand when it comes to cards. Jonathan persisted. I practice where I can, but I fear my opponents are no match for the fine gentlemen I come across at such events as this. It wasn't even a lie. Jonathan did enjoy playing with the various men of the English nobility, though he enjoyed it a lot more when he won, which was quite frequently. And is that why you sat at my table? The Duke cocked one of his wiry eyebrows, the hair almost crisp in its whiteness. You want to play against a good opponent? Jonathan couldn't recall hearing anything good about the Duke's hand at cards, though he intended to play against him and let him win. He had thought about beating the Duke, but 
Jonathan wasn't sure how a man like him would take such a defeat from someone he didn't even know. I'm afraid such a match will have to wait. The Duke sighed and pushed back from the table. You seem like fine gentlemen, and perhaps another time I will take you up on your offer. If you had been perhaps a half hour earlier, I would have entertained the idea. Alas, I promised those gentlemen over there a drink and some conversation. Jonathan smiled politely and bid the Duke goodbye as he rose from the table and crossed the room. He wasn't sure if the Duke was simply being polite to get away from them, or if he had promised such a thing to the older gentleman. I'm not sure that went well, Thomas muttered at his side. What are you talking about? Jonathan scowled and turned to look at his brother. He called us fine gentlemen. I would take that as quite the compliment from a man of his standing. You were just here to get in his good favours, Thomas stated as though it had been a secret. Yes, and I feel we have made a good impression. It wasn't too bold and it wasn't too timid. I think it made us look respectable, Jonathan said. He wasn't sure if he was really speaking his mind for Thomas's benefit or his own, but it allowed him to hold his head a little higher. I've never seen you so determined about anything before. Thomas said as he moved to stand up. What are you doing? Stay seated for a while, Jonathan said, pulling his brother down. Why? We have to make it appear as though we haven't just come in here to talk with the Duke, Jonathan said, scouring the room. But I want to leave soon, Thomas groaned. Me too, but I can't let my intentions become obvious. That simply won't do, he said, shaking his head and clenching his jaw. Of course, my lord. Thomas jested and chuckled to himself. Come on, I don't care what these men think, I'm going back to the ballroom. Chapter 8 Emma was sure that the chandeliers were twinkling, more than they had been at the beginning of the night. There was a glow about the room, and she couldn't tell if it was her eyes or not. Nothing else seemed to matter, because she had found someone who had lit a fire in her. Never before had she felt this way, Every time she had looked into his eyes, she had been hypnotised by the green that stared back at her. It had been so intense, yet so soft at the same time, and Emma wasn't sure how that was even possible. She thought of all the gentlemen her mother had tried to pair her with, all the matches that could have been, but she was better off without. Nobody had brought on such curiosity in her, but... Emma found him consuming all of her thoughts as she tried to smile and show her face. She couldn't relax, though, not when the man consuming her thoughts was somewhere in the building. He was both so close and yet so far, and all Emma found herself wanting to do was steal a glance in his direction and smile to herself behind her fan. It was a trick she had noticed other women do, but now she would have done anything for the opportunity. She felt as though all of her previous feelings of hesitation were fading away. There you are, Susan's voice cut her off from her thoughts. I told you, Susan continued, staring back at Elaine. She has been walking around in a daydream all evening. I think we should let her off, Elaine laughed and spoke as though Emma wasn't standing right in front of her. She has danced with a gentleman after all. You speak of it as though it's some crazy thing, Emma said, cocking an eyebrow at her sisters. Is it really that shocking to you that I was able to dance with a man? Don't act like you haven't fought against the notion for a long time, Susan said as she narrowed her eyes. And it wasn't just a dance, was it? We could all see that there was something there. Emma cringed at the thought of the entire ballroom watching her dance as she grew lost in his eyes. At the time, nobody else had mattered. But upon reflection, Emma shied away from the idea of people looking at her. He is a good dancer, Emma said. She was a little more conscious of revealing her thoughts in front of Elaine. Her younger sister lacked the tact that she and Susan possessed. Emma didn't want half the party to know how she felt and she certainly didn't want her mother to know every little detail of what she was feeling. Oh, come on, we're not blind, Elaine laughed loudly. We all saw that he was clearly having similar affections for you too. Emma felt her stomach flutter at the thought, 
though she was slightly anxious that the Earl wasn't really feeling as strongly for her. He asked me to meet him later, Emma said, unable to keep the news to herself. She had already told Susan, but that simply wasn't enough. She felt that she had to tell her younger sister too. How exciting, Elaine said, her eyes bulging. Perhaps he will be the one you marry. That would be a match, wouldn't it, Susan? Our sister is on the brink of being a spinster, and she still manages to secure a match with an earl. It has been one dance, Elaine, Emma said, trying to calm her sister down. She was sure that some of her sister's excitement came from the fact that it meant she would be able to find a good match too. But Emma kept her lips closed about that. You know that it was more than a dance, Susan mused, shaking her head. Emma kept quiet and let her gaze fall to the floor as she waited patiently for the conversation topic to change. The last thing she wanted was to draw out the time she spent waiting to meet Jonathan on the balcony. Her heart was beating swiftly already, and she found herself continuously glancing in the direction of the large door leading outside. As soon as she spotted the dark brown of his curls, Emma knew she wouldn't be able to stop herself from rushing over to meet with him. Emma? Emma? Susan moved to stand in front of her and become the uninvited centre of her gaze. Hmm. Emma frowned and stared between her clearly amused sisters. What? We were asking if you wanted to get a drink to refresh yourself after the dance? Elaine asked, her smile never faltering. Oh, yes, Emma murmured. She followed her sisters over to the refreshment table. Her mind was still in a daze and she felt as though nothing could stop the elation running through her at that moment. Here you are, Susan smiled, handing her a drink. Emma took a few sips of the champagne, the dry aftertaste doing little to quench her thirst, but she didn't complain as everyone else appeared to enjoy it. So, what is he like? Elaine asked. Emma snapped from her thoughts and frowned in confusion. She wasn't sure how to express her feelings in a way that would be comprehensible, especially when her heart had just recovered in the aftermath. He was very polite, and also very... intriguing, Emma said, narrowing her eyes. I felt as though I were in a dream when he asked me to dance, especially after the clumsy events leading up to it. Oh, yes. Susan was telling me that you knocked your last beverage all over him, Elaine said, smirking in amusement. It was an accident. Emma said, not sure why she was feeling so defensive. And he laughed it off while we were dancing. Luckily, he didn't seem to care that I had saturated his jacket. He certainly has a sense of humour then, Elaine said. It's good that he's not too uptight about himself. I would have walked away from the conversation if he had been, Emma pointed out, knowing that her sisters couldn't argue with that point because there had been plenty of times when Emma had done it in the past. She sighed and used her free hand to push back the stray hairs that had come loose. As her fingers brushed past her ear, Emma felt her body freeze. Her eyes widened and her heart sank. Such a small thing, such a dainty object, and yet so important. It's gone. What's gone? Susan frowned as both her sisters turned to her in confusion. One of Mother's earrings. You're wearing mother's earrings, Elaine gasped. They go so well with this dress, I was only going to wear them for the party and return them before mother was any wiser. Emma explained, but now her eyes were frantically glancing around the floor. These are the ones with the gem encrusted. Susan's words trailed off as the realisation of what her sister had lost sank in. They weren't the kind of earrings that were worn without care. They were the kind that her mother would undoubtedly mourn if they were lost. What am I going to do? Emma's voice shook. She was suddenly terrified of having lost the valuable piece of jewellery. We can scour the room and try to find it, Elaine announced with a sudden determination. But it could be anywhere, Emma said, taking the remaining earring out of her ear just in case. The last thing she wanted was to lose that one too. It could have come out at, at the start of the evening. It could have been flung away from me while I was dancing. I went out into the gardens at one point. Emma was suddenly breathing quickly as she realised that it really could be anywhere. All right, 
but panicking isn't going to make anything better, Susan spoke up. We need to think logically about where you could have lost it. I would say that the dance floor is the most obvious place, Elaine cut in. You were dancing and moving about, you could have easily knocked it and it could have fallen out. Yes, but we can't exactly be seen scouring the centre of the room now, can we? Emma said swiftly. She knew that her tone was slightly harsher than she had wanted it to be, but her patience was already waning. Why don't we split up, Susan suggested. Each of us can take an area and try to find the earring without drawing too much attention to the issue. Mother is somewhere in the room, and we can't have her finding out about this. Emma was incredibly relieved that she wasn't suffering on her own and that her sisters wanted to help her. Thank you, Emma smiled at Susan. Thank us, when Mother's earring has been found. No doubt she will find a way to punish all three of us if she finds out about this. Hearing Susan admit that she was helping Ping partially for her own gain took the shine off it slightly, but Emma was still grateful for the help. Emma took off in the direction of the gardens, scouring the floor while walking, though it was proving difficult to do so with so many people in the way. The last thing she wanted was to bump into someone else. Her heart was hammering so loud that the sound thundered in her ears. A heaviness settled on top of her chest that reminded her of the time the family cat had taken a nap in the same place on top of her and made it hard for her to breathe. Her mother was sentimental about her jewellery and the thought only made it worse. She would eventually have to come clean about taking the earrings without permission. A few people caught her panicked eyes and stared questioningly, but Emma passed off um, uh, any look of intrigue and refused to engage in conversation with anyone she passed. She no longer cared if they thought her rude. She had a much more important issue to solve. Tracing her route to the gardens made her realise that she was also following the route where she'd first bumped into Jonathan. She realised that the second dance was almost over. Emma's eyes widened in realisation as she remembered that she was supposed to meet him on the balcony. Suddenly torn with what to do, she took one final look about the area before turning back and heading for the doors of the balcony. Emma decided that she would go back and check the gardens once she had spoken with Jonathan, though she wasn't sure that the earring had been dropped out there. She tried her hardest to retrace her steps in her mind and think about when she had last felt the gem in her ear. But it was a hopeless waste of time. Emma had no time to prepare herself as she stepped out onto the balcony. But there he was. She wasn't sure whether to feel relief, panic or frustration that she still hadn't found the earring and it was keeping her from enjoying what should have been a great moment. But as soon as those green eyes were locked with hers. Chapter nine. Jonathan tried to stop the happiness he was feeling from overwhelming him. While he hadn't been waiting out on the balcony for long, it had been long enough to begin forming doubts in his mind that Emma had simply been polite in dancing with him. The two dancers had passed, and he could hear the music picking up as the third dance got underway. But there she was, standing before him and making him feel like the luckiest man in the world. He was smiling at her, but... Emma didn't look quite as pleased to see him as he had been hoping. It's a beautiful evening, don't you think? He asked, gesturing to the mild night air about them. I suppose it is. I'm just glad that we're staying here tonight and don't have to return home. The carriage gets awfully stuffy in the summer, Emma said. Jonathan couldn't help but notice the way her eyes were darting around as though something was wrong. It caused his heart to drop slightly, and the doubts persisted in his mind. His thoughts were suddenly tripping over themselves in an attempt to work out what could possibly be upsetting her. He thought of the idea of another man offering her something that was too good to decline, but Jonathan was positive there was nobody else eligible who could rival him. Are you all right? You seem perplexed. Emma shook her head in response. I'm fine, she said, just a little overwhelmed from all the excitement of the evening. Jonathan didn't believe her. He could see it in the way she was carrying herself that something was indeed wrong. Emma was shifting about, but 
still trying her best to keep her movements discreet. You have nothing to worry about. The most beautiful woman at the ball should never have anything to worry about, he said, trying to reassure her. But what Jonathan realised was that he was the one who needed reassurance at that moment. You are too kind with your compliments, Emma said, her cheeks flushing suddenly. It was a slight hope that she was still interested in him, and Jonathan found himself clutching at it. I suppose you must be tired, though, he continued. After I left, I imagine there were many other eligible men who wanted a dance with you too. Hmm? Oh, no, I didn't dance with anyone else, Emma said quickly, though it was evident that her thoughts were elsewhere. I was just with my sisters. While she was simply brushing off the conversation, what she didn't know was that she had just said exactly what Jonathan had needed to hear. She hadn't danced with anyone else. That didn't mean she wasn't already betrothed, but Jonathan was sure that she would have made such a fact known to him much earlier if that were so. Stop being so doubtful, he scolded himself. As he continued to fight with his own thoughts, he failed to notice at first that Emma was constantly glancing back and forth, as though she was unsure of where to look. Are you sure there is nothing on your mind? I'm... Emma cut herself off with a heavy sigh before shaking her head. I've lost my earring, she said finally. Jonathan blinked a few times as he realised what she had said, though it hadn't been the answer he was expecting at all. You've lost your earring? It's my mother's earring, she continued, her beautiful eyes suddenly wide and glassy. They shimmered like a pool of water at midnight and captivated Jonathan in a way that made it difficult to focus on what she was actually saying. The jewels are expensive, and she doesn't know that I've been wearing them all evening. I've lost one of them, and if I don't find it, I'm going to have to admit to my mother that I was wearing them without her permission. While it wasn't the kind of news he'd been bracing himself for, Jonathan could understand why Emma was quietly panicking about her situation. Have you looked around for it? Of course I have, she said with slightly narrowed eyes. All right, I apologise, Jonathan murmured. So do I, I should not be so rude to you, Emma said, closing her eyes for a moment. I'm so sorry about this. I know we should be talking about much more interesting things than my mother's missing earring. Then... Let us go back inside and find your earring, he said suddenly. Are you sure? Emma asked. She clearly hadn't been expecting that reaction. Of course, this sounds like quite the emergency and we shall not stop until the earring is found, Jonathan said as he started towards the doors of the balcony. Wait, but my mother is in there, so we need to be discreet in our search, Emma warned him as they reached the doorway. In her panic, her hand touched his arm. It was only a slight moment of contact, but it was still enough to cause Jonathan to falter for a moment. He simply stared at her, and Emma didn't say anything either. He wasn't sure how much time elapsed as he looked into her eyes, but Emma was staring at him with the same intensity, and nothing else around them seemed to matter. Finally, she cleared her throat and looked away as though the urgency of the situation was suddenly reaffirmed. Shall we go in and search for it? She offered slowly. Her voice sounded different, but he couldn't put his finger on why. Jonathan nodded his head slowly and followed her inside. Her blonde curls caught the light almost instantly. He couldn't help but admire how she shimmered as he walked behind her, but the spell was quickly broken when Ak Emma turned back to him. You'll need to keep your eyes on the ground if we're going to find this earring, she explained. It really could be anywhere. Don't sound so hopeless. I am sure it will be found, Jonathan said, flashing her a reassuring smile. Recovering the earring would be a very good way to win over Emma's affections, and he was very determined to find it. What if someone finds it before us and keeps it for themselves? Emma winced at her own question. Then you can be sure something bad will happen to them when they least expect it. Do you really believe that? Emma frowned. I believe that the Lord works in strange ways, but that he is just. He will punish those who do wrong one way or another. And so I believe if someone does take your mother's earring, they will do their penance in some way. 
That is a comforting thought, but it would be even more comforting if I could simply have the earring back in the first place, Emma said, managing a slight laugh. Emma was surprised at how determined Jonathan seemed to be. She had thought him a kind and polite gentleman, though it was quite the surprise at just how positive he was. Emma was much less hopeful and was already preparing herself to explain to her mother that she had lost the expensive earring. I must say, I haven't been the easiest woman to entertain this evening, what with me spilling a drink over your jacket and then losing my earring. You have been quite the gentleman about it all, Emma said, smiling to herself as she walked at his side. I shall take that compliment in my stride, Jonathan said, keeping his head high. I don't know of any woman in this room that would want to have a dismissive and rude man at her side, and so I don't think acting as such would ever do me any favours. Believe me, I have seen and heard many men who would not have such patience, Emma said. She thought of the various gentlemen that her mother had tried to push in her direction. They had all been far too in love with themselves to take much notice of her and what she liked. She watched Jonathan make his way around the ballroom, keeping his head down and his eyes fixed on the floor. Emma couldn't help but let out a slight laugh as he narrowly avoided bumping into one of the servants with a tray of drinks. The servant barely managed to swerve at the last moment, but Jonathan was already past him and still staring at the ground. Emma held a gloved hand to her mouth to suppress her laughter as Jonathan continued around the room, clearly not caring about the confused glances thrown his way. She found herself smiling fondly at the help he was providing but then caught sight of Elaine and Susan watching her. Her sisters were clearly pleased for her, and Emma realised they must have seen her enter the room with Jonathan. She wished she could just enjoy getting close to him, without the sick feeling that gripped her stomach whenever she thought about the earring. Nothing, Jonathan said, shaking his head as he returned to her side. Emma breathed out heavily, her body deflating and her shoulders sagging. Her mother would not be pleased to see her poor posture, but that was the least of her concerns. I don't know what to do, Emma said. The announcement that the penultimate song was about to be played made her realise that time really was running out. I, I'm sorry, but it seems you may have to go to bed without the earring after all, Jonathan said, then pursed his lips. If you never see me again, it will be because my mother has locked me in a tower for what I've done, Emma said, trying to make light of the situation. Then... I will come and rescue you, Jonathan shrugged. I will come and save you from the tower so that you can be with me. Emma laughed at his words. She hadn't said it so that it would lead him to say something like that, but Jonathan had clearly been trying to find a way to charm her. I will look forward to you rescuing me, Emma said. But on a more serious note, Jonathan's tone changed slightly. There was less lightheartedness in it. Will I get to see you again? Will you let me write to you? The question caught her off guard. It was clear what his intentions were if he wanted to write to her. She felt her heart rate increasing in her chest. It fluttered at the thought of getting to know Jonathan better. Of course, you can write to me, she said. Her smile grew uncontrollably, and she was unable to hide the fact that she was incredibly pleased with the outcome of the ball. I would love to receive a letter from you at any time. And I will see you again. It was perhaps the first time Jonathan had sounded sheepish. There was a bashful tone to his voice that hadn't been there before. I would like that a lot, Emma said, nodding quickly. The next ball of the season? If you would have me wait so long, Jonathan sighed. I would be very pleased to see you there. Perhaps you would save a dance for me? Because you will be too busy dancing with all the other eligible young women, Emma asked, cocking an eyebrow. Exactly, Jonathan said, his lips curling up in amusement. I will try to squeeze one dance in with you, though I can make no promises. And this is the same man who can't quite wait until the next ball to see me, Emma teased back at him. Jonathan paused, seeming to have nothing to say in return. You have me there, I must confess. I will now be waiting with excitement for this day to arrive. Emma giggled at his comments and placed a hand to her mouth. The call was coming around for the carriages. 
and Emma knew that she must soon retire. Thank you for this evening. I can't say that I was looking forward to this ball. I never do. But you have made my evening much better. I'm just sorry that I cannot find your earring for you, Jonathan admitted. I'm truly sorry that you are going to have to speak to your mother about it. Emma found herself wincing at the reminder, having to come to terms with the fact that both the earring was lost and that she was saying goodbye to Jonathan was like a double-edged sword. She didn't want to be doing either, and yet she was going to have to do both with her head held high. You have nothing to apologise for. It is my own foolishness that has put me in this position, and now I'm going to have to own up to my actions. Until our next encounter then, Jonathan said, taking one of her gloved hands and placing a tender kiss to the back of it. Her eyes never left his as he completed the action. Emma felt her body melting from the contact. I will be waiting for a letter, Emma said, smiling in anticipation at the thought. I will not keep you waiting long. It was the last thing Jonathan said before he turned to make for the exit. Emma was left standing on her own, the entire evening having been nothing like how she had. Chapter 10 The next morning, the ride back to their home was perhaps even glummer than Emma had found travelling to her cousin's estate. What she hadn't anticipated was that she would be feeling things she had never thought she would experience. She was missing the presence of a man, and that was an enigma indeed. Emma was continuously catching the eyes of both of her sisters, and she could tell that they had a thousand questions on their lips. She wasn't going to answer any of them, especially not in front of their parents. Emma still hadn't addressed the topic of the earring with her mother, and it had been nearly a day since the ball. She knew that time was of the essence, as her mother would soon realise that it was missing, and ask anyway. The carriage came to a halt after only a couple of hours. Their journey wasn't near completion yet, but pauses like that weren't uncommon. Emma assumed it was to rest the horses, or perhaps there was something in the road. I'm going to stretch my legs. Darling, will you join me? Their father spoke up as he opened the door to the carriage. Something that Emma found amusing was the way that their footman would be there in an instant at the slightest movement from within the carriage. The footman helped their mother out of the carriage as their father followed before closing the door behind them. Emma had barely let out a sigh when she found both of her sisters' gazes on her. What happened? Elaine asked. We were too close to mother after the ball finished that I couldn't ask anything. Did you find the earring? No, Emma said simply, not wanting to go into detail about it. I saw the Earl helping you toward the end of the ball, Susan pointed out. It wasn't exactly discreet. He was determined to help me, Emma said, shrugging her shoulders. She didn't like the way her sisters were leaning forward in their seats. Both of them had clearly been building up the questions. Did anything happen on the balcony? Did he say anything to you? Elaine continued. Emma shot her a look that prompted her sister to continue. Don't look at me like that. I've been waiting all day to ask you about last night. It was a rather abrupt end to the evening, Susan reasoned. But let's hear it now. I don't know what you want me to say. We spoke for a while and then he helped me by trying to find the earring. I just wish we could have been successful in that, Emma said, unable to keep her face bright. You seem sad today. I assumed it's about the missing earring, Susan asked. It is partially. We're moving further and further away from where the earring could be with every second I sit in this carriage. I'm going to have to tell mother, and I know it's going to be difficult. But I'm also just sad thinking about how long I'm going to have to wait to see Jonathan again. Susan and Elaine shared a look between them, smiles ghosting their lips. I knew that you were thinking about him. It was written all over your face, Elaine said. He promised that he would write to me soon, Emma said, looking off out the window. Their parents had ventured away from the carriage, and she was pleased to see that they were well out of earshot. But is that going to be enough? Susan asked. Of course not. I already want to see him again, Emma explained. 
I never thought that I would be this person. For years, I have looked on and heard young women having similar conversations that have made me laugh. Now, look at me. I am one of those fools who knows a man where there is mutual interest. Mutual interest, Elaine said. He likes you. I saw it in the way he looked at you last night. Her sister was right. Jonathan's stare had been intense, but it had made Emma feel special. I feel that waiting for the next ball of the season will be too long. I fear that he will lose interest in me, Emma said. I don't think you have to worry about him losing interest, Susan agreed. But I understand it must be difficult to know you're going to have to wait a while to see him again. I suppose it will be nice when I do finally see him. It will feel very special indeed. But it will be a couple of weeks away and... I'm not sure I can wait that long. The three young women were quiet for a while. It seemed that nobody had any ideas that could cheer up Emma. A sudden gasp caused Emma and Susan to jump in surprise as Elaine sat up with wide eyes. Why don't we have a ball at Padvine? She asked, her voice reaching an uncomfortably high pitch. Oh, what fun that would be. And then you could invite the Earl, Emma. It would solve the issue that Emma has, but don't you think it would be a lot of stress for father and mother to have a ball at such short notice? Not to mention the fact that there may be other smaller soirees we would have to compete with. What if nobody turned up? The Earl of Shaftesbury would no doubt turn up, Elaine countered Susan's point. I suppose that's all that matters. We can't convey that to father though, can we? Susan reminded her sister. He's going to want there to be a reason to spend so much time and money on a ball. We haven't hosted a ball for a few seasons now, Emma chimed in. Perhaps the unexpected addition to the season will draw people to Padvine. It wasn't the most outrageous of ideas Emma had, and it was certainly something they were capable of doing. Adding a ball before the next official event of the season would be a good way to see Jonathan again. We should at least suggest it to father, Emma nodded. She could see that in agreeing with Elaine, she had made the youngest, Partington, very pleased indeed. I hope he says yes, Emma smiled. I would love to see Jonathan much sooner. Perhaps we could have the ball next week? Next week? Susan's eyes were wide. Perhaps we should suggest two weeks so that they have a little more time to prepare themselves. Emma winced, but knew that waiting two weeks was still much better than waiting five weeks for the next ball. He wouldn't decline the invitation, would he? Emma, you shouldn't even think such things, Susan scoffed. He was definitely interested in you, and there is no way he would decline such an invitation. Hearing her sister say it out loud made Emma feel a lot better, though the small seed of doubt had been sown, and it persisted in the back of her mind. I know, but I can't help it. I have never been in such a position before, and... I don't want to be naive, Emma said. She had heard many times about women falling for the kind of men who weren't interested in the affections of just one woman, and she was determined not to fall into the same trap of unhappiness. All right, I will be the one to ask father. I feel he will listen to me, Elaine said, smiling. Emma wished she could argue with what the youngest of them was saying, but they all knew it was true. The Duke had a soft spot for Elaine and he seemed to be more reasonable with her than with his other daughters. As the eldest, it had never bothered Emma too much because it meant she had more freedom. Her father didn't look in her direction as much, and that meant she was able to avoid certain responsibilities, like finding a husband in favour of reading. It's annoying, but she's right, Susan said, turning to Emma. I know, she sighed, nodding slowly. Elaine, the youngest and arguably the most immature, was now her best hope. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the full book. The full audiobook will be available on YouTube in a few days. What did you like the most? Comment below and share this video on your social media and with your friends. Watch one of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.